Well, welcome again, Downsview. We're glad to have the opportunity to come together as much as we're separated, nevertheless, to come together in our spirit and our mind and, and in one purpose, that today on another Lord's Day, we'd have the opportunity to honor our King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, to find our very purpose for our existence in making much of and celebrating his worth and his value. Want to welcome others perhaps who are joining us on our online ministry. It's our pleasure that God gives us such technology to reach well beyond the four walls of our sanctuary. And Lord willing, perhaps we'll see you even if you are visiting with us online. Maybe we'll even see you in person one day when we can come back together. It is our express goal throughout the time that we worship today that Christ would be exalted in our midst and that you would find your very purpose in life in making much of him and finding joy ever increasing as we grow in our knowledge of him. We're going to ask the Lord to call us to worship him in the word of God. If you have a copy of your scriptures, please turn to Psalm 28. Psalm 28 and listen to this incredible cry and, and, and plea to God, in a, but a, a cry of encouragement as the psalmist David speaks of his Lord. To you, O Lord, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I will become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy, for when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands towards your most holy sanctuary, do not drag me off with the evil, with the wicked and workers of evil, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Give to them according to their work and according to the evil of their deeds. Give to them according to the work of their hands. Render to them their due reward, because they do not regard the works of the Lord, nor the works of his hands. He will tear them down and build them up no more. But blessed be the Lord, for he has heard the voice of my plea for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exults, and with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. Oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd. Carry them forever. Let's ask God's help in the midst of his presence now, friends. Let's pray together. Father God, for this blessed opportunity you've given us yet again to exalt your worth and to find that we are helped when we do so. We just thank you for that, dear God, and ask that that would be the case, that we'd recognize that our only help is help that comes from the Lord, and it comes as we exalt his worth. We've surrendered our lives to him. We seek to surrender all the more completely, as it were, to you, dear God. We want that, dear God, because you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our allegiance. And so we ask, Heavenly Father, in the mix of distraction, of the noise, of the busyness of our lives, calm our hearts, focus our hearts now on you. May we exalt you in Christ. We pray through him. Amen. Jesus, for the cleansing power, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotlessly white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the sea of your sight? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments by 
all is white as snow Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside your garments that are stained with sin And be washed in the blood of the Lamb There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean And be washed in the blood of the Lamb Are you washed in the blood In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb Are your garments spotlessly white as snow Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb Are you washed in the blood Are your garments spotlessly white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Brothers and sisters, we do have an opportunity to just remind ourselves and encourage one another in a few of the happenings and announcements that are happening with respect to our church family. As you know, things are moving in an encouraging direction. There's still lots of talk amongst the government and medical authorities as to how quickly things are going to return, quote unquote, to normal, but we're moving that direction. Last Lord's Day weekend, a number of churches in our region of Ontario were able to reopen. And today, just about all of them, apart from our little group here in Toronto, Peel, and I believe it's York region, but really here in COVID Central, it's just going to take a little while longer. The reality is, friends, that the numbers are going down. The numbers of vaccinations are going up. And we want to continue to plead with God that he would guide our healthcare professionals and the governments who are making decisions in light of their advice that we could move forward quickly, that these pews could again start to have our church family together for in-person worship. As that is happening, dear friends, guard your hearts. Let's pray for each other that we guard our hearts from frustration and anger, that patience begins, remember, not when we've had enough, not when we're at the end of ourselves, not when I can't take it anymore. That's where patience begins. That's where patience and perseverance begins when we've come to the end of our proverbial rope. So hang in there, brothers and sisters, and continue again to ask that God, who as we saw on Wednesday night, are government leaders who are God's servants to do us good, as Romans 13 reminds us, continue to be in prayer for them. And through this next little while, dear friends, as you know, we have moved our Wednesday evening Zoom chat to Sunday mornings. And so immediately after this church service, watch for the link on the bottom of this video. Watch for it on the email that went out on Saturday. If you are watching this and you can't find it, just text me or email me, or I might not check the email. Probably the best way is to text me or maybe Facebook Messenger. I'll watch uh, as we're conducting that meeting just at noon today so that you're able to click on Zoom. We've just had a, a great time just connecting with one another. It's akin to chatting in the pews or the parking lot, out in the foyer, just to get to uh, remind each other of how we're doing and things that are happening in our lives and the kind of fellowshipping that we just love to do at Down. So please join us to see some faces we haven't seen, to hear your voices. What a blessing. So please come and join us immediately after the service at noon. Just watch for your Zoom link even on this video. As you know, the hub for all of the information for our church, especially our online services, is at downsviewbaptistchurch.com. And if you, some folks have been a little bit confused because it's sort of we're trying to point, point people directly there rather to Facebook or YouTube. But both of those things, all of those Facebook uh, links as well as YouTube links will be found at downsviewbaptistchurch.com. This is what the website looks like. You won't see that yellow arrow there, but that yellow arrow, arrow is where you go on Sunday morning. Click on there where it says Sunday morning live stream. 
and either click on there and it will take you directly to the live stream through Facebook or it will take you to the Facebook page and there you found a link to this video or directly on YouTube. And so that's sort of your hub and just note there that you can do that. Give it a second if it's a live stream. Sometimes it takes a few minutes to go on there, but that's a place that you'll find our online mission and our, all of our online uh, media and the archives for them. Do wanna give thanks again as we have heard from Nathan Drake and his ministry of Reawaken Hymns, that again, they have provided their music for us at absolutely no charge. Now, some of us happen to support this ministry. I'd encourage you to do that. This is a ministry that takes older hymns, traditional hymns, and wakes them up. And you can tell it's not overly contemporary. It's him generally in his guitar. Sometimes with a couple of other rhythm instruments in the back, but you love the hymns, friends. This is a great ministry to support. And I'm really glad that we have had access to that. In a moment, we're gonna hear from another of our ministry partners is how I feel for them, Sovereign Grace Music. They have made their music available again. Very professional, very professionally done. And they have not charged us at all through this entire pandemic. Uh, Bob Coughlin leads this ministry. He does does have a, a podcast and a, a ministry called Worship Matters that you're able to uh, look up if you want to have some more focus on their ministry or worship in music in particular within the a church context. And you can find them at Sovereign Grace Music. This is what their website looks like as well. And I would encourage you as well as they have not asked for any support, but how great it is that we would support ministry partners like this for us. And so as we move continually through our worship service today, one of the things that we've done, and I think it's just been a great success over the last number of weeks and, and months, is to have this one body in Christ that we are here at the church and take the opportunity at one of our members prompting to put pictures up of our church family so that we can pray for each other. So this week we're putting up Carolyn, just what she looks like as I look down on the front row, that smiling face that's always there, that encouragement for worship with their eyes closed and their hands hands in the air. You may remember a few years ago, uh, three years ago almost now, Carol, in June of 2018, that she came into membership here with a number of other folks. And that's just that smile. You just can't wipe it off her face. And it's just so encouraging to have her as part of our church family. Chester and Ariane Hernandez and little Shiloh. She's not so little anymore. This was the day she was dedicated about a year and a half ago. This is them at Christmas time. Just recently, she is growing up. And we're just so glad to have this family that live not all that far from the church. They popped in one day for a visit. I think it's probably the better part of two years ago, guys. And they're still here and they're part of us. And it's just such a joy to have them and their love for the Lord resonate amongst our church family. And Remy, who doesn't love Remy? Remy's just so faithfully down front there. Funny how people have their seats, isn't it? Um, but I look from here and I think, yep, there's Remy. Just a, a of a firm and steadying influence amongst the college and career group folks. I have heard so many testimonies of Remy's life, particularly from his fellow students, about how he's just a steady guy, kind of guy you can just depend on to be there, a man who keeps his word. We had our men's breakfast a, a year ago, February, where we served the ladies, and Remy said he would help, and he was right there. And there he is in the front row with a number of the other guys that were doing that. And so we're blessed to have Emmy amongst our church family as well. So for Remy and for the Hernandez family and for Carolyn, we give thanks to God. So join me in a word of prayer, would you please? Father, thank you for the kindness that we enjoy of a church family that is increasingly growing together as the body of Christ that we are. I do pray, Heavenly Father, for our entire church family, that you would knit us closer and closer together, that our lives would matter one to another, beyond family um, boundaries, beyond ethnic boundaries, beyond family life cycle boundaries, beyond financial states, beyond wherever we have come from, be it new at the church or veterans at the church. We're just thankful, dear God, that you are continuing to grow us together in grace. So dear God, this morning for Remy and for the Hernandez family and for Carolyn, we give you thanks. We ask your blessing on them in particular and that we as a church family would be encouraged and enabled to lift them up before the throne of grace all the more because we have heard of them just briefly today. We give you thanks for them. We need them. They acknowledge they need us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that that would be the trajectory of our lives together in the Lord. Hear our prayer for them, dear God, today. And 
Heavenly Father, you know the challenges and the griefs, the difficulties that folks are dealing with here at the church, the joys that they are experiencing and the happiness that is, is going on despite this pandemic, dear God. I pray for those silent prayers, perhaps prayers that only you have ever heard. They, people have never told anyone else about either the things that are thrilling their soul because they don't want to put other people off, things that are discouraging them, and they can only give the words, as it were, to the Lord. Hear those prayers, and please, would you, dear God, answer in grace. To the glory of your Son's name we pray. Amen. Friends, now we come to the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, as you know, is the book. And we read the scripture, we extol the scripture, and we read about Christ and we extol Christ by the means that he has given us through the word to indeed preach the word. 
And I'm very grateful that my friend and growing in friendship, David Hallett, is going to take the Word of God today and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ by opening it for us and hauling us to live in light of it. So David, thank you for doing that. Brothers and sisters, will we now give attention as our brother opens the Word of Truth, indeed the very words of life. May we be more like Jesus because we've met with him through his most holy inspired scriptures. David. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this Sunday to hear God's word and to uh, worship him together. Um, the pastor asked me this week to speak to you. And uh, whenever I get asked to speak at a church, I always hesitate um, for many reasons. But one of the reasons that I hesitate is I never know uh, what topic I should pick, um, especially uh, when I come back to North America and I've been in China for a long time, several months, and I don't know what's been going on there, uh, where the listeners are. But uh, thankfully, the pastor was kind enough to give me a topic for today. And uh, mostly because I asked him to give me a topic. And he was kind enough to do that. And he asked me to talk to you today about unity, unity in the church. And this is a very, very important topic. Um, we live in a world today which um, depends on where you come from, frankly. Um, all of us, I shouldn't say all of us, probably most of us who are listening to this, live in the Western world. And in the Western world, we emphasize individuality, doing your own thing. And that is the paramount virtue, uh, to be free, to do whatever you want, do whatever pleases you. Uh, this is why we have Baskin Robbins 31 flavors. This is why there are 17 kinds of Cheerios. This is why when you go to the store, you can buy all different co colors of the same shirt. Because people like individuality. People like doing their own thing. Now, as most of you know, um, Cindy and I have come back from China. And things in China are completely the opposite. And that is Chinese culture and a lot of Asian cultures, not just Chinese culture, but a lot of Asian cultures emphasize community or the group is more important than the individual. And in, in Western culture, Canada specifically, the individual is more important than the group. So in China, the people in charge love to use this to their advantage. They say, um, you should do what we say because we know what we're doing and we know what's best for the group. Whether they do or not is an open question. But we all need to submit to the greater good. We all need to follow what the leaders say because we want to live, and this is a phrase that you'll hear over and over again in China, we want to live in a harmonious society where everyone is together in harmony and there is no conflict, there is no division, there is no separation. It is a harmonious society. So Westerners think you can be unified by doing your own thing. Everybody does their own thing and in that way we're all the same. And in China people are unified by asking themselves what is the best thing for the common good. But the Bible is not Chinese. The Bible is not Western. The Bible is better than both of those things. And the Bible talks about unity in a wide variety of places. Psalm 133 is the classic example, a very short psalm. Um, I almost was going to use this as my main text for the sermon today, talking about how beautiful it is for uh, Christians. Well, he doesn't use Christians, he uses brothers, but 
people in the same group who dwell together in unity. So Psalm 133 is a classic example of unity. But the text that I've selected today actually comes from the book of Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 15. And I want to look at the first um, seven verses. And then, once we finish looking at those seven verses, I want to continue on to look at the final six verses. So, from verse 1 to verse 7, and then from verse 8 to verse 13. And the title of the sermon today is The Power of Oneness. The Power of Oneness. From Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 13. But before we look at the text, uh, won't you join me in a word of prayer? Father God, we thank you so much that you love us and that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. And so now, as believers, we ask that as we look at your word, you would open our minds to see the truth from your word that we would hear your voice as you speak to us about what it says, and that you would change our hearts to do what it says, to please you, and to give you glory. Cleanse my lips now to speak your truth, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the power of oneness. The power of oneness from Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 13. Now, we haven't been going through Romans recently at the church, so I thought I would start by giving you a little bit of background to Romans chapter 15, just so that we can understand where we are in the book. The big context for um, the book of Romans is, this is a church, um, or, or if you're at all familiar with the book of Romans, Romans is one of those books that uh, a lot of doctrine comes from the book of Romans because it talks a lot about faith. Martin Luther used Romans and Galatians to build his uh, Reformation doctrine of justification by faith. And so Romans is a book that has a lot of doctrine in it, but it also is written to a particular group of people. And those are the Christians who lived in the city of Rome. Now the Christians in Rome were having some problems. And one of their problems that they were having was conflict between the believers who were Jewish and the believers who were Gentiles. When the church first started, this was a church made up almost exclusively of Jews. And then because of certain historical events in the Roman Empire, Jews got kicked out of the city of Rome for a period of about 10 years. And so the only people left in the church would be Gentiles. And over those 10 years when Christians were out, or Jewish Christians were out of the city of Rome, this was the time when the Gentiles uh, started to become believers and the Gentile church in Rome was built up. But at a certain point, the government changed their mind and they allowed Jews to live in the city of Rome again. And so a lot of the Jewish Christians who had been gone and couldn't live in the city of Rome came back and those Jewish Christians thought they would just slide right back into the church and, and take over and run the show and everything would be great. And these Gentiles who had become believers and had been holding down the fort for 10 years were like, sorry, that's not the way it is. We're in charge now. We're the boss. We make the rules. We, we are the ones that make the decisions. And the Jews are like, but you're filthy, disgusting Gentiles. We don't want you in charge. We're Jews. We have the law. We have all of these things. And so Paul has to write a letter to this church explaining several things. And his overarching explanation is we have to look to the gospel to answer any of these questions. What, does, what is the gospel and what does it mean? So he, he introduces 
uh, sends them a greeting, writes the introduction, and then from the middle of chapter one down to pretty much the middle of chapter three, he spends a lot of time talking about, guess what? Jews are bad. Jews are evil. Jews are sinners. And guess what? Gentiles are bad. They're also sinners. They're also evil. And both Jews and Gentiles need a savior. One is not better than the other. Then from the middle of chapter 3 through chapter 5, he talks about if everybody's a sinner, how do we come to faith? What causes faith? And he talks about justification by faith alone. Talks about Abraham justified by faith and what it means to believe God and to trust him in faith. Then in chapter 6 through 8, he begins to talk about how important it is for the church, both Jews and Gentiles, to understand the place of the Old Testament law and grace and the Holy Spirit in the life of Christians. Is the law over and done with? Is the law a bad thing? Should we forget about it? What is grace? Should we sin more so that we can have more grace? And how do I live in the power of the Holy Spirit? So all of these things get covered in chapters 6, 7, and 8. And then in chapters 9 through 11, Paul begins to talk about the plan of salvation, God's plan of salvation for both Jews and Gentiles. And he goes through history and talks about what it means to be a Jew and all the benefits of being a Jew and, and how God has a plan for saving his people and how Gentiles are part of that plan and how they are added in to uh, the tree. Uh, the branches are broken off and other branches are put in. So he's trying all through all of these sections to walk this fine line by explaining the gospel to explain to them Jews aren't the best, Gentiles aren't the best, Jesus is the best. And Jesus is there to bring both Jews and Gentiles into the body of Christ. And together they make up the body of Christ and they together equally are God's children. And so from chapter 12 through to the section we're going to look at today, Paul talks about how to live the gospel. And what does it mean to be a Christian? If all these things he said are true, what are we supposed to do? So this section we want to look at in detail today is on a section that is towards the end of how to live out the gospel. And it starts in chapter 14. And it goes through to the end of the section we want to look at in detail today. That's chapter 15, verses 1 to 13. And this whole section, 14.1 to 15.13, is about love and it's about liberty. And so in this larger section he talks about uh, what meats are okay to eat, what vegetables are okay to eat, what special days should we follow. And he decides, or, or he ex Paul explains to them, that we're not supposed to pass judgment on other believers, and we're not supposed to put a stumbling block in front of others. And again, Paul is trying to walk a fine line here to try and explain to both Jews and Gentiles, differences between you are not important. What you share is most important. And what you share is Jesus. And for that reason, you need to be united. The power of oneness. So, in the message today, from Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 13, Paul wants to answer two key questions about Christian unity. The first question he wants to answer is in verses 1 to 7, that is, how can Christians be united? How can they be united? To answer that question, he is first of all going to give the answer, then he's going to give an example, and then finally he's going to pray for 
the church. So all of that is in 15, 1 to 7. The next question that Paul is going to answer is why? Why should the church be united? And he explains that in verses 8 through 13. And again, he's going to first of all give the answer, then he's going to give an example, and finally he is going to pray. So in both questions, how can we be united? Why should we be united? He's going to give an answer, he's going to give an example, and he is going to give a prayer. So let's move our way through these verses together and see what God has to say to us today. So let's start with the first question. How can we be united? And in this question, Paul is answers that question in the first two verses. He says, first of all, in verse 1, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Now one of the things that you're going to notice as we work our way through this passage is that Paul begins by talking about we and us and our and ourselves. And he's going to emphasize, first of all, what we is, meaning Paul and, and his ideas. But then he's going to shift later on and focus on you, what you are and what you need to do. So you notice here in these first uh, two verses, in the answer part of how to be united, he makes a contrast between the strong and the weak. Now, I'll, this is not the only place that Paul talks about uh, the strong and the weak. He also talks about this in 1 Corinthians 8-10. to And there's a long section there about um, stumbling blocks and other things. But what I want us to notice here are some things that, that maybe we don't always emphasize in this discussion. Because I'm looking at it through a certain pair of glasses. And the glasses I want to look at is unity. So, strong and weak are part of the same group. They are unified. And notice what he says in their unity. That those who are strong, those are people who are mature. They have certain um, understandings of the faith. Maybe they've been Christians longer. Maybe they understand the scriptures better. Now, please understand, in the church, some people are strong in certain areas. Some people are strong in other areas. Some people are weak in certain areas. Some people are weak in other areas. I don't think that Paul is trying to say, when you are strong, you've solved all your problems. Everything is, is fantastic. We all have strengths. We all have weaknesses. But in those areas that we have strength, Paul talks about the fact that we have an obligation. An obligation to the weak. In other words, we owe the weak something. It's not something that we deign to give them or if we're feeling in a good mood that we give to them. This is something that we owe them. It's an obligation. It is a duty. It is a requirement for us as the strong. So in areas where I'm strong and I know that, that I am strong, that doesn't mean I use my strength for my own benefit, but I use that strength that I have to bear with the failings of the weak. Another word for weak here, um, you could also, it's often translated in other places in the Bible as powerless. The people who are powerless. In other words, they're not stupid, they're not dumb. They, it's not that they haven't come to the same conclusion as you for any other reason other than they are powerless. They, it's, it's through no fault of their own. 
So when they make mistakes, when they have problems, it's not our job to criticize them, but it is our job to bear with them, to help them, to encourage them, and not to please ourselves. In other words, it's our job to help other people when they make mistakes. Now, oftentimes, what can happen in the church is when, especially new believers, make mistakes, there's a lot of correction. You don't do it that way, do it this way. This is wrong, you're doing this wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Frankly, what the text says is, we who are strong should bear with the failings of the weak. Help them, not to please ourselves, but to build them up. That's what verse 2 says. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. When Jesus in the gospel talks about the law, and remember there are Jews here, and Jews love the law, what is the discussion about, what does the law rest on? It rests on one thing. Two things, actually. Loving God and loving your neighbor as much as yourself. What does verse 2 say? Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. So the point of how do we express unity in the church is in those areas where we are strong, we help those, we build up those who are weak. This is the first step in real Christian unity. If I come to church and I know that any time I make a mistake or I do something wrong, people are going to come down on me and criticize me and um, correct me in an unloving way, am I going to want to be there? Am I going to want to be in a church that's constantly ready to swoop in and smack me down? I don't think so. Let us each please our neighbor for his good to build him up. That's the answer. Second of all is the example. And Paul uses the best example he can possibly use. The example is in verses 3 and 4. Here's what it says. For Christ did not please himself. Jesus is always the best example of everything. Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. And we'll talk about where that comes from in a second. But he finishes by saying, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. In other words, what we're talking about here is Jesus is the ultimate perfect example of someone who was definitely strong and did not please himself. In fact, he was willing to go to the cross and die on the cross for not his own sin, but for my sin for the sins of Jewish believers, for the sins of Gentile believers, for all believers. He was willing to die for them. When you think back on the life of Jesus in Luke 22, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying, what does he say? If there's any way that this cup can pass from me, I I want that, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus did not please himself. He didn't please himself. He pleased the Father, and he built up those he would save. Isaiah 53 carries the same idea in the Old Testament, talking about the 
the suffering servant who would to come, who we know is Jesus, says that Jesus carried our burdens and our sorrows. Philippians 2, verse 4, talking about unity again in the body, talks about looking out for the interests of others. And again, Paul uses the example of Jesus there. Now, I also want to, to, to mention quickly, Paul quotes from Psalm 69, Psalm 69, verse 9, when he says, The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Psalm 69 is a psalm that talks about having a zeal, having um, a desire to please God. And because of having that desire to please God, someone is criticized by others. Now you can imagine in this church that the Jews and the Gentiles were criticizing each other for the way they did things, for the things they emphasized, and yet Jesus becomes the perfect model, the perfect example for us to follow. In his zeal, he was criticized by others, but that's okay. Jesus did not please himself. He was only interested in pleasing God and building up others. So Paul uses that to say, the Old Testament is great. The Old Testament is fantastic. What was written for us in former days is for our instruction so that we can be encouraged by the scriptures to have hope hope is not crossing your fingers that everything is going to be okay hope is a certainty in knowing that God will keep the promises that he has made so how can we be unified by building each other up who is the best example Jesus so he finishes answering this question by praying, praying for this church in verse 5 to 7. And here's the prayer that he gives. He says, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. The prayer that Paul prays for them is not that everyone would agree. That's not the unity he's talking about. That everybody would come to the exact same conclusion and that you would all act the same way and do the same thing and therefore be unified. No, he asks for endurance. He asks for encouragement so that they can be in harmony. One of the commentaries that I looked at said about this very well. Robert Mounts, in writing on this, these verses, says this. His desire that they should live in harmony, talking about Paul, his desire that they should live in harmony does not mean that they should all come to the same conclusion. That is obvious from his discussion of the weak and the strong. The conscience of each is to guide the conduct of that person. It is unity of perspective that is desired. Take on his values, or sorry, and that perspective is that of Christ Jesus, our model for Christian conduct. Think as he does. Take on his values and priorities. As each member of the church draws closer to Christ, we will at the same time draw closer to other members of the body. The experience of Christian unity produces a symphony of praise to God in which each voice blends with all the others to the glory of God. It is a family affair. We, the adopted children of God, sing praises to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul prays not for unanimity, but for unity, a symphony. Not every instrument sounds the same, but together they make beautiful music. When we look at the world, the world 
is often interested in alliances or unity only in the case of self-interest. So that you end up with phrases like, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Which sounds kind of weird. But as Christians, this is not a philosophy that we need to adopt. What Paul is telling us here, quite bluntly, is this. The friend of my Savior is my friend. They don't have to be the same as me. They don't have to look like me. They don't have to think like me. But if they know Jesus, they're my friend. We're on the same team. We're part of the same body. We're part of the same family. So he concludes, Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. When I read that verse, it just reminded me of the parable of the prodigal son. When his father saw him coming back at the end, when he wanted to say sorry to his father, and his father ran. In ancient Near Eastern culture, fathers don't run. That wasn't dignified. That's not the right thing to do. And yet the father is so happy to see him. He runs and throws his arms around him and welcomes him back. I think that's what Paul is thinking about, or maybe not thinking about, but the same idea here that we should welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So this is how we are to be unified. For the, the following six verses, Paul talks about why. Why should we be united? And this is from verses 8 through to verse 13. And again, he's going to talk, give us the answer. Then he's going to give us an example. And finally, he's going to pray. Let's look at the answer. The answer comes in verse 8 and the beginning of verse 9. Paul says, For I tell you, that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, that is the Jews, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So, why should we be united? Because of two reasons. God, or Jesus, first of all, became a servant to show God's truthfulness. In other words, why did Jesus have to be born as a Jew? Why did he have to be in the line of David? Because, Paul tells us at the end of verse 8, God made promises. God made promises to Abraham. God made promises to David. In the Old Testament. These were not standard uh, uh, contracts or agreements that could be broken. These were promises. Promises that God made. God made a promise to Abraham that the whole world would be blessed through him. God made a promise to David that his son would sit on the throne forever. And so, why did Jesus have to be born as a Jew? to show that God is not a liar, that when God makes promises, he keeps his promises. And why did God not only save Jews instead of, uh, or instead of Gentiles or, or without Gentiles? God made a promise to the Jews, and so he fulfilled that promise, but Jesus became a servant so that when Gentiles came in, and Gentiles were grafted in to the olive tree. When Gentiles came to faith in Jesus, they would recognize that not only is God truthful and faithful, he is merciful. And he is willing to include all in his offer of salvation. He is willing to save all, not Jews only, not Gentiles only, but he is willing to save some from all different kinds of people. Now he moves on from here to talk about, uh, I, I won't really call it an example, 
I'll, I'll refer to it as examples, but together there's one key point, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean here. In Starting in the second half of verse 9 and going through to verse 12, he lists several different places in the Old Testament that talk about either Jews or Gentiles. Let's take a quick look. Starting in verse 9, second part, he says, As it is written... Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Then in verse 10, he says, And again, it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Verse 11, And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And finally, verse 12, And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. Now, the one thing that you notice in all of these verses, the common word in all of them is Gentiles. Gentiles. But Paul has cleverly weaved together all of these verses with not simply to say, look, here are some verses from the Old Testament that show that God's interested in Gentiles. That's part of it. But he's very careful in selecting these passages to be used. Let's notice a few things. Number one, the first place he quotes is uh, spoken by a Jewish person who is among Gentiles. The second verse is spoken by Gentiles among Jews. The third one is spoken about Gentiles alone, and the last one is spoken about Jews and Gentiles together. In other words, he is using these verses to show that Jews and Gentiles belong together. Jews and Gentiles in the Old Testament are have always been and will always be part of God's plan together. The other interesting thing that we can note is where these verses come from. The first verse comes uh, from two places. Both of these are Psalm 18.49 and 2 Samuel 22.50. The next quote comes from Deuteronomy 32.43. The next one comes from Psalm, Psalm 117, verse 1. And the last one, is, as he said, from Isaiah. It's Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Now, the thing that you should notice about that is, by quoting these four verses, he covers every section of the Old Testament. He covers the law. He covers the early prophets. That's what we would call the history book, 2 Samuel. He covers the later prophets, Isaiah, and he also covers the Psalms. In other words, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms all speak about Jesus as saving both Jews and Gentiles. This is not something that Gentiles made up to horn in on, on the good deal that Jews had, and now Gentiles are coming in and wrecking it, that's not it at all. God has had a plan from the very beginning through his servant Jesus coming born as a Jew to save not only the Jews but to save people from all over the world. And that's always been God's plan. So he finishes, Paul finishes in verse 13 with another prayer. He's talked in the first section about how to be unified. Now he's going to pray for them to understand and accept why they should be unified. And what he says is, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Interestingly, God is both the object of hope and the source of hope. The God who gives hope will allow you to abound in hope in Him. 
and in his promises. So God is both the giver of hope, God is also the source of hope. And in hope, people will be filled with joy. Paul is praying they would be filled with joy and peace so that when they experience this joy and this peace, this feeling will encourage them to do something. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you would abound in hope. You would act in a way that pleases God. So what have we said? How can we be united? Paul says the answer is by bearing each other's burdens and building each other up. Who's the best example? Jesus. He is the perfect example of one who didn't think about himself and because of that he was able to save us. So the prayer is that understanding this truth that the church together would glorify God in unity. Why should we be united? The answer is because that's always been God's plan. God isn't the God of the Jews only. God isn't the God of the Gentiles only. It's always been God's plan from the beginning to save a people from, for himself from all the nations. The example comes from the Old Testament itself, the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. All these three together show us that God has this plan. So what's the prayer? The prayer is, be filled with joy, be filled with peace, be filled with hope so that you can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and be united together. Now, we don't live in Rome. I, I don't happen to be Jewish. You might be, but I'm not. I'm a Gentile. What's the application for us? I don't hate Jewish people. I love Jewish people. I love Jewish Christians. What is the application for us, Downsview Baptist Church, in Toronto, in 2021? I think we need to, to, to ask ourselves to look at our church and ourselves and ask some very important questions. What is our church like? How unified is our church? How together are we? How much are we bearing each other's burdens? How much are we caring about other people? I used to live in a city of 24 million people, and that's Beijing. And in Beijing, people would step over their grandmother laying in the middle of the street because I got bigger things to deal with. Now, Toronto only has four or five million people, and yet in Toronto, we can get very similar feelings in the world. I've got my own problems, I've got my own things, I don't worry about anybody outside myself. But the church, the church is a special place. The church is the only place in the world where any believer and every believer should be welcomed. Every believer should be welcomed in the church. Every believer should feel at home in the church. That this is your family. That this is where you belong. That this is the place of comfort and support and bearing of your burdens. If people come into our church and they don't feel welcome, they don't feel at home, then we're doing something wrong. We are doing something wrong. Because that is what God is asking us to do through, through this book of Romans today. We need to be together, to be unified, to be a church where people feel welcome, people feel at home. Because we share something, and what we share is a relationship with Jesus. So when we focus on Jesus, when that becomes the center of what we care most about, then the differences that we have, those things should begin to fade away. We all don't become the same. 
I don't want you all to start looking like me. That's, that would be too horrible. I don't want you all to start talking like me or acting like me. Nor should I begin to look like you or talk like you or act like you. But we should all care about each other. When we focus on Jesus, those things that are different between us, cultural things, age differences, all these other differences, should fade away. Because what we have together is a family, a unity, a body that we belong together in Jesus. That's one of the exciting things about working overseas, especially in a place like China where the government doesn't want you there. When you meet other Christians, wherever they come from, whatever country they come from, whatever denomination they come from, as long as they believe the gospel, there is a unity there. There's a desire to be together because it's us against the world, literally. And so one of the things that we need to focus on, thankfully at this moment in Canada, uh, the government isn't trying to destroy the church, but that could change, who knows. But as a, as a church, whether in China or in Canada or wherever we are, we need to be focusing on Jesus. And if we have differences, those things will fade away the more that we focus on Jesus. Unity is the key. It's the key to giving God glory. It's his plan. Jesus is the perfect example. This is what he wants. When we are unified, this gives glory to God. And for the world, unity is the key to evangelism. Last week, the pastor preached from John. I'm going to quote to end the sermon today from John chapter 17. Jesus is praying for Christians, and he prays for them to be unified. Look at what it says. This is Jesus praying. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us. Now look at the last words. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. When the church is unified, when the church cares about each member, when the church is devoted to building each other up, the world is going to notice and the world is going to turn to Jesus. I encourage you to think carefully today about what God is saying to you about how you can build others up in our church to make us unified to spread the gospel throughout the world. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that Jesus is that perfect example. He was unified with you, and he was selfless in his desire to build others up. Help us to be unified. Help us to be uh, selfless in our uh, dealings with others, that the world would know that you are on your throne and that you are willing to save not only Jews, but people from all over the world because of your mercy and your grace. Help us to be those lights that shine so that the world will see that you will be glorified, we will be united, and the church will be built up. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.